Thanks, Blythe. I appreciate the introduction and uh, kind of helping to set the table here for tonight. And I was uh, really honored to be invited to, to, to help facilitate this discussion. I was familiar with CPN and have learned more about it over the last couple of months since we've uh, been planning for this for tonight. Uh, just an amazing, an amazing uh, program and um, honored to be here. And I was also glad when they said that the format of this is for the facilitator to present for about three or four minutes before turning it over to the panelist. Uh, I thought that was not just kind of, hey, that sounds good to me as the, as the presenter, but also I think that's the right, that's the right formula. Uh, you guys aren't here to hear from me, but hear from the actual experts um, and, and, and Joe and, and Dave and, and Glenn. So let's do that. The first though, let me kind of share a couple of quick slides and I promise that they're quick. And all right. I'm gonna trust that that is working and that everyone can see that. All right, so look, it's not the 1950s anymore, right? No one here is Jude or June or uh, Mr. Cleaver or whatever the Leave of the Beaver family was. But uh, look, some of the gender stereotypes that have persisted for, for centuries and decades um, still persist today, right? And not everyone's going to fit into those stereotypes, certainly, but as a, as a society here in, in, our, in our country, uh, this is generally kind of what people think of women and moms and men and dads, right? Moms and, and women are, are emotive, they're more sensitive, they're more emotionally in tune. They're kind of the ones that you go to as a kid if you skin your knee or if you really need to kind of get some TLC um, and I think are seen by and large as kind of the essential parent. And, you know, men and dads are a little bit different, right? They're traditionally seen as the, the breadwinner, maybe of the family, uh, the person who, who kind of is the fixer, maybe not as emotionally in tune or, or as um, in touch as moms. And I think can sometimes be seen as, especially for younger children, kind of the complementary parent. Now, of course, these are broad strokes that we're talking about. Um, and they don't fit everyone by any stretch. But I think that's generally how, uh, you know, kind of our society still views um, the, the two genders. And, you know, it's really seen across settings, including, and in particular for this group, in the medical setting, right? So I work in the cancer hospital here at UNC, as Blythe said, and um, I see it all the time, right? I see where the pediatric oncologist or um, the nutritionist, whoever, when they come in the room, the inpatient room, or even the clinic room, they tend to gravitate toward the mom, right? Even if mom or dad are both there, it's kind of like mom, you know, this is what we're doing, mom. And it's kind of, if they have to ask how the kids slept last night, they tend to ask the mom. And, you know, it's, it's subtle. And I don't know if anyone takes that much offense to it, uh, at least not in the moment, but that's kind of the stereotype. And look, I'm, I'm a guy, as a psychologist, I fall into the same thing. Um, that that the flyer you see there on the left of the screen is the first flyer that we organized or that we put up when we started the group for men who had lost their wives or partners to cancer um, and were raising uh, children on their own, right? Something Blythe briefly talked about. And if you look at that flyer, you'll notice when we were thinking of what to call it, it with the hopes of attracting men to kind of, you know, come join this thing, we called it the education and support group, support group instead of just the support group, right? With our biased, stereotypical thinking probably, being that men would not be as kind of drawn to a support group, right? That's kind of what women do, right? I don't want to sit around and talk about thoughts and feelings and sing kumbaya and that kind of stuff. And so we even title it the education and support group, when in reality, it was a support group. Um, and, and so I think it's important to recognize that that's, those biases and those stereotypes exist. And people will say, well, stereotypes exist for a reason. Um, and to some extent that's probably true, but it's, it's, I think, just as important to look at kind of the bi-directional relationship of that, right? So sometimes stereotypes are a certain thing and then we conform to them as opposed to kind of the opposite of that, right? Um, and I think that that can have all kinds of effects, right? We all kind of tend to kind of play the role that we are assigned or we kind of wonder if we should or think we should. And for that reason, men are less likely to seek out or accept support that's offered to them in times of need, whether they're in crisis, whether they're grieving, 
Um, you know, the, the literature on that is, is crystal clear. And we've seen it in our, our own experience, the, the group there we started for the fathers, we, we had to hustle to, to, to get our group when um, some colleagues of ours started a similar group for mothers years later, uh, they, had their, they had their fill within a day or two, right? And so it's not, you know, and that's probably why, I, I don't know if there's a, if there's a um, kind of mom correlate presentation to this in May for Mother's Day, but there probably isn't because it's kind of harder to get guys to the table for this kind of thing. But that's not to be confused with that men don't have the capacity or that men are somehow kind of hardwired in some way um, that they can't do these kind of things, that they can't come together, that they can't express um, emotions or be vulnerable or connect with others. And, um, you know, that's just, that's just not true. And that picture down there you see at the bottom is our first support group that we ran with all these fathers who each of them would tell you and even said so that first night, you know, they didn't really want to be there, right? They weren't a, a support group kind of guy. Um, but once they kind of got past that, right? Once they kind of got past the, the sense of, you know, is this all right? Can I do this? Is this where I want to be? Uh, the, the, the men were off, right? They were, um, they connected. Um, in fact, you saw in that brochure, we planned for it to go six sessions. This group went for four years. And that's not because we, we, we compelled them or we you know, guilted them into it in some ways, because they connected and they bonded and they grew together and they grieved together. And we see that over and over and over again in our groups. And so it's not, the challenge is not so much that men can't do this kind of stuff. It's getting them to kind of acknowledge that they can do this kind of stuff and that they can connect. And so that's why when, when Blythe and Jennifer asked if I wanted to do this tonight, I was like, absolutely, because I think this kind of forum is needed. And, you know, fathers like Joe and Dave and Glenn, who I got to meet in preparation for this, um, you know, I don't know if any of them would say that they're support group kind of guys or whatever, but clearly, you know, when we got together the first time we met, they're, you know, they're all each wonderful and talk about um, their children and their, and their heartache and their hardships. And I imagine everyone that's here tonight can do the same thing. So with that being kind of the uh, backdrop for tonight, I, I do wanna turn it over to Dave, first of all, um, to, to kind of get your take, Dave, on whether you think that those, those kind of stereotypes that I laid out kind of resonate with you, not that they match you, but that you experience them in some way either at the hospital with your, with, with your wife and your child or in, in other settings. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Thanks um, to Blythe and Jennifer for organizing this room for being here. I think um, those, the, all the comments ring so true for me. Um, and I'll, I'll share a story about, I, I think kind of encapsulates that. But um, the first thing I would say is thank you to our um, our neurologist who delivered Alden's diagnosis surgically because we we got this all during COVID. And um, so I wasn't in the hospital, right, with my wife and our son. And you know, they took the time to, and I'll, to call a phone call, I'll never, you know, never forget, right? It's the, the hardest call I've ever had in my life. Um, but they took the time to deliver that to us together, right? And so I think there was a partnering, even though we weren't physically together at the start, that that could have easily been delivered differently, right? Especially in the COVID circumstances. And I don't think I've necessarily appreciated as much as I do right in this moment, thinking about those stereotypes and how easily it could have been to just say, you know, mom, you're here, here's the diagnosis, here's the story, right? And um, so reflecting on that, what a, what a blessing for us to, you know, um, excuse me, hear that news together um, and, and sort of, even if we weren't physically there, but, um, so to, to your point about, um, you know, meh, I definitely would have not put myself in the category of a, a therapy or support group kind of kind of guy. Um, and frankly, I probably you know failed. We we tried to uh, start couples therapy pretty quickly after our son's diagnosis, thanks to some recommendations of um, you know people we connected with in those early days, and come up with the reason you want to pick any day of the week, right? Too busy caring for the, caring for the kids with work, et cetera. Um, and I was dragged there 
inside kicking and screaming on the outside, trying to be supportive. And, you know, honestly, after two or three weeks, my wife sort of said, you know, I think I'm really connecting here and I'd like to do this by myself. Um, I don't know how she was feeling about th that connection and, and having the therapy just be more effective because I was dragging things down, but it was pretty clear. I was not as engaged as I could have been. And I think I just wasn't ready, right? It was too quick. I was in a different state of, of grieving and trying to get my own kind of arms around those emotions. Um, and we're, we're now in couples therapy and we got to a point um, with our current therapist where, you know, he said, or said, you guys seem like you're in a pretty good spot. You know, maybe we can push out for you know, a month or something to, to our next meeting. And I was quickly raised my hand and said, no, this is like, this is really important to me. Right. And because I, that hour or so we spend with him is forced. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but it's kind of set time where it really helps bring me back to focus on what we're going through. And that's incredibly important. I found, um, you know, we're, we're clearly, you know, all humans are capable of, of emotion. I won't speak for others, but I know it's, it's a lot more work for me to draw that out and be open about it. Um, but when I am and I'm open and forthcoming and vulnerable with my wife, with friends, with, you know, anyone who will listen, really, it's, um, you get a lot more out of it. I think you build a lot deeper relationships. Um, I think you become, you know, I'd like to believe a better person and, and be able to sort of go go at the these challenges that we face as um as parents as fathers of a child with their own complex medical issues in, in a much um from a stronger point so um i don't know glenn if you want to talk a little bit but that's some thoughts from for me thanks Dave. yeah and now i'm gonna yeah. now i'm gonna go to shoe i'll buy myself a second here <laughs> now here you we'll all be getting one uh yeah no i mean the stereotype type for me and, and you know my daughter was diagnosed eight years ago with this uh rapidly degenerative and terminal disease so it's been a rough rough eight years um but but you know I, I like a lot of dads I fell into the the stereotype of of the protector right you you're checking the, all the doors and the windows at, at night to make sure everybody was safe and um you know trying to fix any problems that threatened any type of safety to your family. Uh, and, and here co along comes something that you've never heard of before that is completely out of your control. You know, there, there's nothing you can do to fix it. Uh, and, and there's nothing out there that's going to fix it quickly uh, or, or, or even, even possible. So, so what do you do? Uh, and, and it's, that's hard to get through that. And, um, you know, my only advice over the, these eight years that I've learned is is just to be be real easy on yourself. You're, you're you're trying the best you can. You're doing the best you can. There's some things that, um, that you know, with with uh, with time, you know, you, you can't beat time sometimes. And and um, you know, trying to process this this type of thing yourself. Uh, to kind of Dave's point about, about, you know, help trying to process it yourself is rough. And, and I know it because I tried it for far too long, trying to just kind of get through it myself. I can rough this out. Um, but, but I, I, I got to the point where it's, you're near breakdown and, and you're doing no good for, for yourself. You know, you're doing no good for your family when, when it gets to that point. So um, finding, finding people to talk to uh, was, was critical for us. And, and it was, it was, some some friends it was you know some other families that parents that had this disease that certainly helped to kind of uh put put that to come before us you know that that certainly helped um it was also some old friends i had from you know going way back to high school those friends that that were just there for you and uh would would listen and and wouldn't you know wouldn't try to fix things wouldn't try to give advice would just listen they were just there to listen and someone to talk to and then and then you know my, my wife and I are very uh upfront about us us both going and getting getting professional help too and and even the professional help that that you know the counselors that that we talked to um they didn't have a whole lot of solutions uh you know it's, it was it was kind of shocking to them our story and what we were going through and and dealing with a, a child who was you know dying basically um and losing skills, you know, every, every day, every month. And, uh, 
but they were, they were there to listen and it was cathartic to be able to just get it all out, you know, once a week to get it all out, to talk it through uh, with someone. And, and that, that was very, very helpful. So, so for me, it was, um, it was good opening up and, and not trying to think that I was, I was a tough guy and I could get through it myself. You know, it, it was being vulnerable and saying, I, I can't get through it myself. I need, I need others. So Glenn, I have to follow up with that before I turn it to Joe. I'm curious to, you know, you've, you've obviously grown over the last eight years in these ways. Do you, do you still though kind of have a, a sense of like, you should be fixing this or making this better and, and, you know, you're kind of fighting against time and circumstances beyond your control. Is that still a struggle? Uh, I, it's still a struggle, but I've, I've let a lot of that, that go. I've let a lot of that go. I know that you can only control so much, you know, um, you know, my wife and I started a nonprofit foundation. So we've done a whole lot to fight, try to fight the disease and, and uh, help, help for not just my daughter, but for children with this disease in the future. Uh, and that has been, you know, that for me, that has been, uh, been uh, helpful as well to just know that I'm doing good. I'm, I'm helping and, and hopefully helping, you know, end this disease in the future. So, um, but, but it's, it's still tough, you know, it's still tough. The day to day is, is still tough. Yeah. I don't, I don't imagine it's not, it's going to ever not be tough. Um, so, so Joe, I, I'm, I'm, I am curious to hear from you too, you know, just, uh, you know, you, you have all the sports paraphernalia in the background. You seem like kind of a guy's guy. Yes. Yes. All right. You, I, that wasn't actually a question. You know, the answer, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah, is absolutely correct. Uh, okay. No, right. but you're, you're, you know, th th thank you, Justin. Yeah, and thank you everyone for being here, Dave. And, and thank you for sharing. And Dave, uh, unfortunately I got the call. Uh, by myself from our doctor that uh, Matthew was diagnosed with CLN2, said it was a Friday night, Michelle was out to dinner with the, uh, with one of her friends and uh, said, okay, thanks, I'll let her know. And uh, hung up the phone, went to Wikipedia, and then boom, uh, life expectancy, eight to 12 years, neurodegenerative disorder, won't be walking at a certain point, talking, you know, the whole, the whole thing. And, um, you know, and uh, just completely called the doctor back and said, whoa, 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 what, what, what is this? I just looked this up. I mean, and he said, well, we got to do more testing and all this other stuff. I'm like, what? And then the first thing that popped in my head was, what do I tell Michelle? You know, and that's just, you know, the doctor can't answer that. For me. <laughs> like, we can tell her, I guess, you know, so I called her and said, you got to come home. Um, and then, you know, after a couple of more uh, doctor's visits, um, that's when the reality set in of, of, of his diagnosis and his terminal illness. Um, I think one of the big things that kind of, um, well, first off, Michelle's a psychologist. So she immediately knew I needed to go on medication. So, you know, and uh, she did as well. So, you know, that was, <laughs> it's one of the benefits of having an in-house psychologist, but uh, in terms of our relationship with each other after getting the diagnosis, um, I, I wasn't making a joke about it, but I'm like, you know, relationship wise, we're perfect for each other. Biologically, we're toxic. And um, one thing that stood out that I, that I still never forget, it was my sister. She goes, you guys must be fighting all the time. I mean, is it, you know, I just must be fighting all the time because this happened. And and then and I, I said to her, I said, no, no, we're not, we're not fighting. We didn't do this to each other. This is just, this is biology. This is just, you know, a bad, a bad, a bad mix. And uh, you know, biologically. So, um, but you know, being shell shocked and everything uh, initially from getting the diagnosis. Um, but you know, again, going to see the doctor, uh, uh, knowing full well, I was at least not stubborn enough to know full well I couldn't handle this mentally by myself. I was going to need some kind of assistance. So that took the form of therapy and, 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 and medication. Um, and I think you kind of slowly get back on your feet and there's so many people that want to try to help you and, and, and whatnot. And 
Um, but I think, you know, between me and Michelle, it was more about, okay, kind of like, what can we, what can we do about this? And, and believe me, there's, when we got the diagnosis, we were told there's nothing you can do about this. Um, and we were told there's like this trial going on in Germany. So we kind of gravitated, oh, we'll, we'll go to Germany. We'll, we'll send one, one of us, we'll just go to Germany. We'll get him in the trial. And we'll, we'll, we'll get treatment for him. Um, ending up getting a trial into a trial here in, in the States in Ohio. Um, luckily, I mean, one of three kids in the country. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I think we're one of the very, very few people that could shift the narrative to an actual plan of doing something about it, or at least having the, the, the thought of being able to do something about it. And I think the two of us collectively focused on that. And I think it would have been a completely different story if we weren't having something like that to focus on, for sure, it would have been extremely much more difficult. Justin, if I can, um, just one kind of, I think linking comments that both Glenn and Joe made and kind of sharing how it resonates with me, but um, you talk about kind of hiding some of these feelings or tamping them down, kind of burying it and trying to go and fix things and just push on through. Um, and Joe, right, people around you saying, well, you must be fighting, et cetera. And I, I think um, there was a quote in the slideshow, if anyone joined early, from another father who talked about, um, you know, men tend to push things down and push their worries around because to be a provider. And I, I would say in the last year and change, you know, I've, I've probably been my worst self when I've let those feelings, you know, get sort of pushed down and bubble up and they just grow and fester. Um, and that makes it a lot harder to, to partner with my wife. I mean, she, she calls me out on it, thank goodness. And um, for early days, I'm sure I was denying how, you know, the state I was really in. Um, and it's been, it is a work in progress, but the ability to try to acknowledge when you're down, when you're stressed, when you're totally distracted, when stress is coming from work or somewhere else, right? Um, and figure each other out, figure yourself out, just be open and honest about that. Um, because we've kind of only, it's not fair to say we only have each other. We have great support network, great caregivers. There's wonderful groups like this, right? But you have to, I think, have that core. And it's the two of you are in it in a way together that is, is unique as parents, right? And um, you're not gonna be your best self every day, but the less you can be your worst self, you know, I think that's a good formula, hopefully, so. Yeah, hey, that's a really, oh, go yeah, ahead, I'm sorry. No, I, I think, I think Dan, I'm glad you said something about that, because I think that's uh, uh, relatable and probably pretty familiar kind of sensation to a lot of people here is, you know, you are kind of just, just you know, your child in this case is, is, is given this, this, this terrible illness, diagnosis and there's a million things to do and there's a million emotions that you're feeling. And sometimes it's, it seems a little bit easier at the beginning to kind of just tuck those emotions down and deal with what's at hand and, and just kind of suppress those emotions. And it, sometimes that's probably fine to do. I think it's probably helpful to do that, but like, like you indicated that that risk kind of clogging up your 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 internals if you're if you're just pushing down and not kind of getting out or talking about it or kind of releasing the dam a little bit and it sounds like you learn that you are learning that lesson the hard way sometimes um joe has that been something that if you can kind of go back to when your child was first diagnosed and and, and even now do you do you find yourself kind of having to catch yourself from not kind of packing in your emotions and thoughts? I think, I think mentally when you're alone with your thoughts, it can take you to some really, really dark places. And very early on, that was prevalent. Um, just, just bad thoughts of, you know, Maddie going blind, just, just all the things that you read about happening, you know, something simple as being at the kitchen table and him knocking over a sippy cup and going, is he blind now? Is he, is he going blind right now? Like just being completely on edge. And, you know, I think, you know, without somebody to talk to, I mean, you, you would just become a non-functional 
You know what I mean? Because the, you can't just stay alone with yourself. It's it's totally not healthy for sure. So how how do you bring I me mean, that? I, I think that some people and myself included, I can know this. It, it's hard to kind of know how to bring it up, right? It's hard to say, you know, hey, hey, honey, I'm really having a hard time today. Can I talk to you? That's just kind of weird, right? Or, you know, you start to just pick up a phone and call a psychologist. So how how have you guys found ways to kind of let some of that pressure off the off the buildup of the dam? Glenn, I'll ask you if you can. Um, yeah. For how us, how have I mean, you found ways to do that? Yeah, for, I mean, for us, Dave's, you know, resonated with me on, on, you know, your relationship with, with your wife, you know, and, and we had a solid, you know, solid core base of, of love and, and all was good. And then you get thrown this curveball in life where everything's thrown upside down and the stress and anxiety uh, every day, every, almost every second of every day is, is at the nth degree, it seems. Um, you know, my wife and I found out that, you know, a lot of times we, uh, while we were both sort of in the fight together, we both kind of were, were, were uh, aligned in that, okay, we're going to try to fight this disease, try to try, try to go make a difference. Um, as far as the emotional support and all that, it was clear that um, it was hard to be there for each other because we were both going through the same thing in the same house. And gosh, when she was down, if I was down at the same time, it, it, we'd, we'd basically fall apart. So it was almost one of us always had to sort of be the, the strong one. So we realized we, we couldn't, we weren't able to, we were there for each other, but it was hard for us to be, um, to be that, that release. And, and um, you know, we realized a lot, there was a lot of bickering, a lot of, you know, we'd get in these really dumb arguments over whatever that, that just, and, and finally we kind of had a, had a, had a revelation that like, wait a minute, we're, this, this doesn't, none of these fights and arguments have anything to do with how we feel about each other. It's all the stress and anxiety of what we're going through and dealing and thinking about our da daughter 24 seven. And um, that's what's really behind any of these things, these back and forths and, um, you know, trying to go through, we were trying to go through life and trying to somehow be happy. And we realized it's okay, you know, to not, just be magically happy when your child is dying of a disease. Um, it, it's hard to just be happy and just say uh, life is good. So at least what we came up with, what worked for us, my wife and I was, we said, well, if we can't be happy with, with life overall, we can at least be happy with each other because none of this has anything to do with how you and I feel about each other. Um, we love each other. We had a great, you know, we always have loved each other and we still do. Um, so when we looked at it that way, it, it has, uh, over the years, certainly it, it is really, um, we've been able to connect more on a, on a, on a, a deeper level, uh, when we think about it that way. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of my best friends is a, a realtor and he said this all, his job was all about location, location, location. And when it comes to this, it's all about communication, 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 and that's hard to do easy to understand intellectually but hard to do and you know we've been talking so far about kind of what it's like to have you know all your focus on on your child and your relationship and, and kind of how you're doing but as everyone here understands the outside world does not stop right um mortgage payments don't really they don't care <laughs> what you're going through um the the bills keep coming and job responsibilities are what they are i'm wondering um if any of you guys want to speak to kind of how you found some balance between work and still, you know, tending to these new responsibilities that are that probably taking up a lot of your time. And that may include finding refuge in work. And that was kind of a nice escape or feeling guilty about going to work and having to find that balance. I don't know who wants to kind of take the lead on this one. Yeah, I can, I'm happy to kick off, um, Justin. I think, you know, everything you just said is true, right? There's guilt about going to work because you're not there, right? Helping to take care of our son and, and our, you know, our neurotypical child too, right? I mean, the, there are specific extra challenges that come with a medically complex child, but you still have a family, right? And they all need care, especially ours are, ours are young, right? So they're, they're by no means independent. And then there's guilt about being at your desk sometimes and you get a Facebook notification that pops up or something, you get distracted because it's 
uh, a group that, you know, is people with similar conditions, ch children with similar conditions, whatever. I mean, there, there's a million and one distractions or you've got to deal with, you know, some crazy health insurance conundrum that sucks up all your time. And then you feel like you haven't gotten your work done. And then it spills over because you don't, you haven't gotten family done. I think, I don't think there is a balance anymore. Um, I don't know if there even was before this. It's more of a tug of war. And um, I think at least day to day, right? You have to find what works over time. It's changing for us. I'd be thrilled to hear if Joe or Glenn had figured out a way that, you know, it gets easier. My guess is it doesn't. Um, so I think the most important thing and something that we work on together, because um, it's the support from, from my wife, Laura, as well, is that, um, you know, you've got to, got to be okay with it and you've got to just talk to each other and forgive yourself for um the days you're not focused in one area or the other i know you're doing your best and that yeah um, you know you're talking to each other about where your time's allocated and that it'll be okay but to your point communication and it's by no means do we do it well every day um but i think it's you got to cut yourself a little slack because sometimes you just have to go to work and you know um, in our case, in our in our family right now, it's very much the stereotypical gender roles. That's kind of how it's split, and we try and you know, every few months check in to make sure that's still the right split. And we'll see, you know, how that lasts. But the the weight of there's a tremendous amount of pressure uh, because before we even had the diagnosis, it was, I always had the better insurance plan. So I'm always the one that's had the insurance since I've had my job uh, with my company since 2004. Uh, but that pressure of, you know, having a mortgage and all that stuff, you just magnify it times a hundred now because your son needs medical needs that are going to skyrocket the, uh, the the medical builds and the and the medical thresholds. Uh, case in my my son's medication that he takes every two weeks is roughly around uh, to the insurance company seven hundred to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. So uh, and it is covered under our my my insurance plan with my company. So uh, when you when you start there and just and just kind of think of like gosh forbid if I ever lost my health insurance. Now we have a backup plan um, and we also have New Hampshire Medicaid uh, as well, but um, that, 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 um, that safety blanket or safety net I, that we have currently right now, you know, there's a tremendous amount of pressure to, to, to keep my job because it's a sales job. So it's, you know, it, there's ups and downs, there's, there's good months, there's bad months. Um, but overall, in the back of your mind, you just try to do whatever you can to make sure that you're keeping your insurance policy, especially because it can just be so hard to get insurance companies, especially with with rare diseases, um, to cover to cover certain things at times. Um, you know, we've been very fortunate, but you know, I've seen in other in other states and and other families that are dealing with CLN two disease with not only one child, but two children, uh, both, both siblings have, have it. Um, and the struggles that they go through, through these insurance companies, you know, uh, you know, right now our insurance company only covers Matt up for a year and then they reevaluate. So, <laughs> you know, it's, so it's, it, you know, so we know they're going to approve it, but, but still it's that, you know, every year, Oh, we got, we got the approval for this year. We're, we're good to go. But you know, there is a tremendous weight that we that I personally carry as a result of the diagnosis and what we have to deal with on a, on a daily basis. Yep. When we struggled the same, I mean, my wife um, immediately uh, quit her job as a pediatrician and uh, I worked from home. So so it worked out for us where I would work and uh, we were in a bit of a unique situation where we were we actually isolated our family long before coronavirus, but we isolated our family in the hopes of getting in a clinical trial, a gene therapy clinical trial. Um, so my wife, so my kids were out of school being homeschooled. So I'm in my back office trying to do the work and get the mortgage you know, paid and get the bills coming and insurance. Um, and and um, and she was out in the in the rest of the house 
with a six-year-old and a three-year-old with San Filippo syndrome, trying to do that 24 seven, basically. So, you know, and I would, I would come out and help. So it was, it was, and that, that lasted for two years. Um, so it was, it was very, very hard and, and boy, did I have it much, much easier than she did for, for sure. Um, and, and I would help where I could, but at the same time I, I was trying to do my job and, and I'll just be honest, those two years, I was, I was not a good employee. I, I, I was more interested and more focused on trying to do more for our, our foundation that we had started. I was more interested in trying to save my daughter and, and save kids with this disease uh, than I was at my job. Thankfully, my, my company, my boss, everything knew my situation. They, they nearly, I mean, they really insulated me and allowed me to, to do, um, do what I needed to get, get the job done, but, but no more. And, you know, any aspirations of, of climbing the corporate ladder and moving up to, you know, director and, and above, um, all those went out the window when, when my daughter was diagnosed. It just, it, it, none of that mattered. And, you know, a, a career, we, yes, we have to pay the bills, but, but um, I wasn't looking to, to, to do that any longer. And, you know, that's, can be hard to let go of. Um, you know, I asked my wife about her, you know, leaving her, her job as a pediatrician. Cause again, you know, she did a lot of training to become a pediatrician and all that. And for her, it was, she was a pediatrician for special needs children, ironically, the time my daughter was diagnosed. And for her, it was, it was a good, actually a good break because emotionally it was just probably going to be too tough for her to continue to see at that time, you know, other special needs children and, and, and help them at the time. So, um, uh, but she's, she's done amazing things since, of course, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a juggling act trying to just get through and, and ensure you can still uh, provide for your family. Yeah. I think you guys are giving voice to this, you know, kind of notion that life was one way before your children got sick and you kind of had this imagined trajectory of where you were headed what life was going to look like, what was meaningful to you, what wasn't. And all that either shifted in a day or has shifted over the months and years. Um, and now different things take priority and different things are meaningful and uh, probably requires a lot more flexibility <laughs> um, day to day. And then, but just also kind of trying to judge or trying to expect kind of where life's going to take you because, um, you know, being in control of our destiny is always kind of an illusion. Um, but that illusion has probably been shattered for, for you three and probably most people on this call. Um, and it seems like kind of giving yourself and your husband or wife or partner kind of some grace um, is probably a really important thing because I doubt anyone here was a perfect person or a perfect parent before their child got sick. Um, you know, you're sure as hell not going to be perfect now. Um, and you don't need to be. And so, look, we've heard some, I, I feel like we could kind of have Dave and, and Glenn and Joe talk all night, but I do kind of want to open the floor here to see if uh, what other people either kind of have comments or thoughts on what, on what we talked about so far, or maybe some new insights. Um, and Scott, I know you said something, Scott Newport, I know you said something in the chat earlier. I kind of wanted to, to call on you to see if you care to elaborate on that. And while Scott's figuring out his mute button, if, 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 if anyone has a question or anything like that, please put them in the, uh, in the chat. Just, you can put either the question or just your name and I can, uh, and I can kind of call on you and then, um, and then unmute and, and we'll go from there. All right, Scott. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Hey, my name's Scott Newport. I'm from Royal Oak. Um, I'm a bereaved father of a son with Noonan syndrome. I lived seven years. I also work in pediatric palliative care at the University of Michigan as the uh, parent mentor, and I work in genetics in the state level and also uh, child special health care, but I'm actually a carpenter by trade. Uh, the reason I said truth matters and our minds are a nasty thing is I think Joe was talking about something where his mind took off, right? So when I work with parents, I always say truth matters, and everyone goes, well, hell yeah, it does. I go, but our minds are nasty things. So that's the one thing I've kind of noticed with some of the guys here that um, as we try to do the right thing, sometimes our minds get off on uh, some of these things. The other thing I was noticing with maybe some of the dads was um, most of the families I work with are challenging families, I'll say. So they're, 
drugs, alcohol, those kinds of things, and they have kids with terminal illnesses. And uh, I'm always interested in maybe one of the dads or two can ask, in their marriage, do they divide and conquer or do they do things together? Because when I was married, we divided and conquered, and I thought that was a really good thing, but I, now I think it maybe wasn't. Can, can, can I ask, before they answer, Scott, let, let me ask you what, why, why you say it wasn't with the benefit of hindsight. What, what makes you think that? Divide and conquer isn't? Yeah. Well, because it's, so a, a divide and conquer, from my standpoint, is like, um, I'll take Noah to soccer, you take care of Evan at home. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, go to school today, you help, because we had full-time nursing, my son was vent trach. Uh, spent you know a year in the hospital from birth on so so you know as opposed to doing things together let's go to the grocery store together you go to the grocery store I'll mow the lawn so that does that make sense yeah yeah okay got it yeah so, so Scott it's um something you know I draw back on the earlier comments kind of about you know seeking some professional help and we were just talking about this recently um, where, you know, the way that he helped reflect it back to us, which resonated with me is at times we're in parallel paths, right? You know, next to each other, um, but we're not necessarily together. And day-to-day -day chores, tasks, it's a mix. You have to, I think you have to practically divide and conquer certain things, right? I might be, I might be at work and my wife might be running the kids to school or grocery shopping, what have you. But um, you know, I think the big things, the big moments, whether it's a doctor's appointment, um, you know, big decisions, um, we try and do as much of that together as we can, and then try and create that family time where it is together. And I think, um, you know, one of the things we're working on and CPN has been a great resource in some of this is, is the sibling factor too, right? Um, how do you split your time between both? And I think right now we're trying to do all that together, but our kids are one and a half and three and a half. So I think there's going to be you know, challenges that come and draw on support from folks like yourselves that are here and, and other resources to figure out, you know, if you've got whatever sport, I mean, those challenges only grow, right? If you've got sports and care and um, it's a Joe Glenn and, or anyone else really curious how others think about it, but. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd say we, I mean, we do the same. We divide and conquer on some things and other things we all, all go together. Um, you know, for us, it's it's been, in a ch with a child with San Filippo, uh, it can be very uh, loud and no peace and, and not a moment's rest. Uh, so when both parents are on, nobody's off um and you always have to be on so so what my wife and i have come up with and you know obviously we're, we're fortunate to be able to to do this but you know she my wife will go away for a weekend and go to a friend's house or maybe three or four days uh during the week or something just to get away and get some headspace that is quiet and she can do whatever she wants whether it's work or read a book or watch a movie or, or hang out with friends or do something. And then, and then two weekends later, I'll go away somewhere for, for two or three days. And I, I, we're leaving the family, of course, which makes it hard on the person that's home by themselves. But at the same time, it's, it's the only way that we've found a way for, for us individually to get, um, to get a moment's, moment away and, and a moment sort of, of just some type of calm and some type of peace. So yeah. that's a strategy that, that's worked for us. Um, yeah, a little bit, so. Good, Scott, I appreciate you bringing that up, and uh, Dave and Glenn for your answers. So we have a couple of questions in the comment section. Uh, real quick, June asked a question as to, um, earlier I had mentioned that we have a hard time getting fathers and support groups, and she has asked if I have any, um, any kind of suggestions on how to do that. Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> and the longer answer is if you have any good ideas, let me know. Um, I, I think one thing is, is, is kind of just breaking down kind of this stereotype and breaking down this sense that fathers can't be vulnerable and can't ask for help and can't be a part of support groups, along with the fact that we don't just sit around and, you know, I don't know, hold hands and, like I said, sing kumbaya. We just, you know, it's pretty real. We just kind of get to it. It feels a lot like this does tonight. Um, 
So, it, but it, it's tough, it remains a challenge. We've been leading these groups for 11 years and it remains a challenge. Um, Eric, you have a question um, or you put your name in there. So as soon as I did. you have a question, thank you, you. Uh, take it from here. Thank you. Um, thinking a little bit about what one of the earlier speakers said about the, uh, the challenge of divide and conquer. Um, and I think I appreciate the, um, even though on a functional level, dividing and conquering really is, you know, practically, I think what we as parents often have to do as we're, um, as we're trying to negotiate the, the, the many challenges of keeping our family afloat while taking care of our sick children. Um, I think we sometimes forget that as we're going through this journey with our dying children, we as parents and as individuals are not static entities. We're as our children, if it's a neurodegenerative illness or any form of any process where we are gradually losing a certain level or at least perceiving that we're losing some level of connection with our child, as our child is changing or as we are experiencing our child changing, so are we. And we're not the same individuals at the beginning of this process as we are six months or a year, or in my case with my daughter, nine years into the process. And as we're each sort of shifting in tandem with our child's changes, our spouses are as well. And I think that the fear sometimes of dividing and conquering is that as we divide, when we do meet back up with each other in those rare moments that, you know, that we can coordinate, we sometimes forget that our spouse isn't the same person that they were when we last checked in with them. And we're not the same people that they remember us being when they last checked in with us. And because of the fluidity of those processes and the way that our child's illnesses are impacting the way that we are unfolding and the way that our souls and selves are shifting and developing and moving and morphing, there's a real risk sometimes and a real fear sometimes that when we do come up for air to check back in with our spouse, the person that we find or the person that they find isn't where we last left off. And that can be really disorienting. Um, it gets to all sorts of questions about grieving together. And while we all can say that, no, our grief doesn't need to take place in parallel, we don't need to grieve in the same ways, I think there is sometimes a very real fear that we're not just losing our children, but we are losing a certain familiarity with our partners. And we are really losing a certain um, sense of connectedness with our old selves. I think I'm now 10 years out since my daughter passed. I certainly would never suggest that I'm not a wiser person. I'm not a more sensitive person. I'm not a more um, compassionate person than I was at the beginning of this journey. I certainly am but there is still a little bit of mourning about parts of ourselves that we have lost through this process. They may be parts that were lighter and parts that were funnier and parts that were more carefree. Um, and I think that we sometimes focus so much on the experience of losing or preparing for the loss of our child through this journey and we don't always make room for parts of ourselves that are being lost and aspects of the selves of our partners that we are losing touch with or that they are losing touch with and being a little bit more cognizant about 
the way that some of those dynamics operate um, probably is is of greater value than I might have recognized when I was going through all of this in the moment and when I was being very, very effective in my dividing and conquering. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate your insights on that. Um... Any of our three guys have any have any thoughts on on what Eric said, Eric? With the, it's great. I mean, great great advice, and I think it's a great thing to remember in communication to to check in, to make sure you're continuing to check in, um, as as you go through it with your wife. And as far as you know, your your personal, uh, even the little things. You know, I, I I still play ice hockey once a week on Sunday, and I've kept that going because that's my one thing that is my it's a little getaway and and it's it's i've done it i did it before she was diagnosed and i've done it after she was diagnosed and i still get to go out and have a beer with the hockey guys and skate around like an old man and and have a have a, a laugh and a smile um once a week so it's small but it's, it's an hour hour and a half out of my time but uh very very important uh to to keep myself connected to the who I was, I suppose, prior to, to diagnosis. Yeah, I think there's this kind of illusion that, you know, we, we kind of want to get back to normal and get back and get back and, you know, that we don't ever get back, right? We're always moving forward. And as we do that, we change, as Eric said. Um, it's, a, it's a new normal, right? And an ever-changing new normal, I would imagine. Yeah, and, and Scott and Eric, I, I um, you know, we, our marriage was tested very early on after the diagnosis because two months, two and a half months, three months later, um, Michelle had to move out to Ohio with Matthew uh, to get treatment because the treatments were only available at Nationwide Children's in Ohio. So there was this lingering fear in the back of my mind of, well, what about us? You know, like, like, you know, and, and, you know, you, and not just me, but, but uh, our older son's relationship with, with, with my wife, you know, because he was staying back with me and we had Michelle's parents um, filling in so that I could get home from work at four or five o'clock uh, at night after he, you know, so they were there to get him off the bus from school. Um, so that was extremely as terrifying, almost as terrifying as the diagnosis <laughs> in some yeah. ways, because it's like, you know, you see the statistics, the, you know, marriage is a 50-50 as it is. Now you throw a, a child with significant disabilities or a terminal illness and it just skyrockets. So, um, yeah, we were, we were tested really, really early on. But one of, the, one of the big things we did, I mean, we made the mutual decision, obviously, because what other choice did we have? You know, there was something that we could, you know, try and, 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 and give him that could potentially prolong his life. And, um, so it was a it was an all in mutual decision. As I said earlier on, the the first time we heard about a trial, it was in Germany, and we were like, okay, well, one of us is going to Germany. Um, so so once we heard it was Ohio, we're like, okay, that's two two and a half hours away by plane. Um, we'll make routine visits, and and we we held our we held up our end of the bargain. You know, I was we would meet halfway at Niagara Falls on a trip. Um, you know, and, um, you know, there wasn't necessarily date time for us, but there was, there was family time for us. Um, so through that, we, you know, we, you know, we, we, we stayed connected and we both got iPhones. So we started texting each other, like a couple of cool kids. <laughs> so, so that was amazing, you know, cause we both got iPhones and there's this text thing that all the kids are doing and we figured out how to use it. So, um, so, so, you know, the, the, we were very fortunate in terms of um, being able to, to communicate through various different, you know, means. Yeah. Thanks Joe. There um, looks like Blythe has figuratively kind of blinked the lights. We have a, uh, we had our a few minute warning here, but um, I know Rick uh, had, had kind of jumped in the chat earlier um and i want to kind of make sure we 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 gave you time to kind of uh see see what you have to add to the conversation right 
Well, I uh, very promotional from uh, you know Massachusetts, and thank you all for sharing, and thank thank you for everybody for this. Um, I just want to touch in actually the comment you made about the cell phones and the technology today. Um, it, it's it's incredible for everything that we all go through, um, especially during COVID. My son's last two surgeries were during COVID, and the miracle of the cell phone, which was that we he we couldn't have visitors, but we were able to FaceTime. And that was just a huge deal for my son to be able to see faces. And so that in today's technology, that's great. On the other hand, my daughter, social media is not so good, but that's uh, said. But um, yeah, my, um, the challenges of the spouse, uh, I would say that we, um, my wife and I always had a good relationship, but it, um, the gender roles, uh, well, the, the, the roles changed and who was really, it, it, it's funny, nobody was in charge before, but, you know, I've had like, you know, um, uh, my background is uh, as a Marine and I was worked in corrections, kind of like alpha in, in a way. And where, um, when this, my wife took charge to this and I sat back very first surgery was an R on how she handled it and how the doctors were coming there. They wouldn't even look at me. They just knew right away. Oh, we're talking to her. And I was at that point really, like, wow, she's incredible. You know, I always knew she was incredible, but she's incredible. She gets it. She's on, uh, she's able to keep up with this. And, and I feel very fortunate and I don't want to take up so much time. We have a little bit of time left, but thank you everybody. It's some amazing stories. It's my first time here. So. Thanks, Rick. I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm glad you're here. And you know, before when we were just real quick, when we were preparing for this tonight, we kind of went through and were given this whole kind of list of questions that we could ask if the conversation lulled. And I said, yeah, we're not going to need that. I have not looked at it once. Um, and I imagine this that we could go on for um, a, a lot longer than an hour. And uh, I think there's kind of a lot of probably a lot of untapped wisdom within this group itself. And, um, you know, just final encouragement for everyone here to connect with someone, um, it, you know, it, these aren't always possible, or maybe they are. Maybe uh, you guys can kind of start a support group. I, it's, um, not to feel like I'm the champion of that, but I guess I am the champion of that. Um, but the point is connect with others. Um, you know, we don't have, no one has to do this in a style or do this alone. So 